my name is Howard An from Rush University of um, Chicago. I want to uh, thank uh, Seattle Science Foundation, really organizing, putting together, and the uh, uh, you know Texas SPAC also. They, they've been instrumental on uh, you know taking care of this webinar, very ed educational. So we're honored to be part of this program, and um, uh, we have uh, basically case presentation. My talk uh, will be very short, ten minutes, and then we got three nice, uh, interesting cases. So I hope that this will be very educational. And we'd we'll like to make this really uh, um, interactive among you know f uh, faculty and uh, panel and uh, questions from the audience. So my uh, talk really is on uh, revision cervical spine surgery, and I'm going to uh, sort of focus because that's a big topic uh, on pseudoarthrosis and cervical deformity. And my disclosure is right there. So. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, that's a program, and I'm going to introduce uh, uh, the fellows who's going to present later on. So, as I said, there are many, you know, reasons for revision uh, cervical spine surgery, and you can see the less. Uh, but I'm going to sort of focus on non-union and deformity. And this is not a non-union deformity. This is an interesting case. I just want a couple of cases. You know, this is a really disaster case with esophagus tear, epidural abscess, came in with a myelopathy. So when I inherited this patient, I had to do a really sort of very difficult revision anterior approach with ENT, uh, corpectomy, decompressed the spinal cord. And I put the strut graft uh, and uh, turned the patient over to a segmental fixation. An example of a revision case. And this is a more recent case of sort of a basal invasionation with a significant myelopathy uh, that required uh, really uh, upper cervical uh, uh, laminectomy uh, for myelopathy, and then uh, uh, occiput to C uh, to you know uh, stabilization because of the uh, high riding vertebral artery. I had to use a translaminal screw. So I don't, you know I can show you a lot of cases like that, but uh, due to the time, uh, I'm going to sort of focus on pseudoarthrosis. As you know, there are many factors, right? And we're going to touch each uh, sort of different surgical grafts and biomechanics. And uh, as you know, not all non-union uh, cases are symptomatic. So it's very important that even though you diagnose radiographic non-union, you have to have symptom from it. And that's usually your base clinical skill. You need to uh, uh, rule out other diagnoses causing neck pain. And when you do diagnose symptomatic uh, uh, neck pain or with or without radiculopathy, my surgical preferences uh, go posteriorly if you had a previous anterior away from the scar, scar tissue. Of course, you can uh, do revision ACDF as well. And I'm not going to dwell on this slide too much. You know, it's really surgical technique is critical to prevent non-union. The uh, meticulous end plate preparation, how you, you know, uh, prepare parallel. And then you don't want to take too much end plate. Then you, you get subsidence, right? So I, I put a little two millimeter hole in the end plate to really bring in uh, stem cells and blood supply. It's the best of both. You you pre, you preserve the end plate strength and also uh, good fusion. And one small hole is better than you know three or four uh, even tiny hole. Graph thickness. You don't want to over distract it. We published uh, a long time ago. Two millimeter distraction is ideal. And the type of graph you put in obviously is very important. My recommendation is uh, frozen cortical cancellous graph. I think that's better than anything else, uh, in my opinion. And biomechanics of plate, uh, controversial, but Frank Phillips actually published a small series showing that uh, really rigid plate is better than dynamic plate in terms of fusion. A little controversial, but I, I believe that. And uh, when you use a rigid plating with a combination of cortical cancellous allograph, I have published single level, double level, recently even three level, greater than 95% fusion rate. So it's really about the technique, I, I think, is, is very important. Uh, not going to talk about really the cages. As you know, the cages becoming better, more porous, 3D printing. I think all these things are going to improve our fusion rate from the graph point of view if you don't use uh, cortical cancellous allograph. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're going to uh, do a surgery, you have to do a good job, right? So even plating is important. Uh, uh, once again, how you put the plate uh, flush with the uh, uh, vertebral body and all that. I'm not going to get into that. Just one word about the screw angulation we published a long time ago. When you put the screw oblique, you have a more low sharing. So I tend to put the proximal screw a little oblique, longer screw, 
and gives you actually, you know, plate has to be very short, so it gives you, and then the bottom screw, I tend to put it uh, uh, perpendicular to uh, uh, prevent pull out. So a combination of the hybrid angulation, it publishes very good biomechanically and practically speaking. So the example of cervical spondylosis radiculopathy that uh, typically, once again, I'm showing you how I do a carpentry. You wanna create a parallel surface on the floor, on the ceiling, and uh, basically you wanna uh, do a good uh, decompression, obviously, and the small hole in the end plate and the plate technique like this for three level. This is an interesting case. This is uh, another disaster case inherited to me with the anterior posterior surgery with non-union with the plate into the esophagus dysphagia, not to mention the uh, uh, persistent uh, uh, neck pain radiculopathy. And the, the worst thing was actually the closure of the posterior wound was so bad that the muscle dehis, Dan Rue talks about is a like sunken valence syndrome. When you have this uh, muscle dehiscence with significant neck pain, there's no cure. The patient is really in bad shape. So I had to actually redo the entry, obviously, because of esophagus and posterior closure with a plastic surgery, and I think the plastic surgery did a nice job, flap, and patient got better, but you don't want to have that kind of case in your practice. Another disaster, one not to do, right? You don't want to put a long cortical, I mean, uh, a shot uh, with the one screw on the top and the bottom is biomechanically the worst, right? So you, you want to do a segmental fixation or hybrid technique, the anterior posterior, that I had to do a major case like this. So just uh, five more minutes on the uh, cervical kyphosis. I think we recently had this uh, uh, symposium uh, on site. So I'm going to go very fast on it. Uh, basically, you have post-laminectomy. There are many reasons you can get kyphotic deformity after surgery, and you have to revise. And um, uh, I think my fellow is going to talk about this a little bit. Uh, we talk about T1 slope, some, uh, some new concept, just like the uh, public instance, the T1 slope too high. Uh, mismatch between cervical lordosis and T1 slope. We talk about that and there are publication on it. Chris Aim is actually uh, developed a, a classification on it. So T1 slope greater than 40, uh, SVA greater than 4 centimeter, and the T, T1 slope uh, minus uh, cervical lordosis greater than 20. Those are all red flag for bad uh, outcome. And I uh, like, like this paper. So so I think I'm going to finish my talk with some case examples, okay? It's kind of show and tell. So uh, this case, uh, there are, you know, different cases of uh, uh, post-surgical kyphosis depends on whether they had an anterior procedure, posterior procedure, whether they had a, they have a, you know, a neurologic problem or just a neck pain. So every patient is different. So depending on the problem, you have to approach it differently. Example, um, this is a patient had a post laminectomy kyphosis typical, but neurologically intact. So number one problem is just uh, you know, neck, chin to chest, and neck pain. Neurologically intact. So my approach for this is, and it partially corrects uh, when you lie down in MRI scan, but no myelopathy, no radiculopathy. So I did a five-level ACDF, no plate anteriorly, and then flipped the patient over to a T2, C2 to T2, basically give nice uh, 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 deformity correction, basically. And this is kind of similar patient with previous ACDF, I mean, previous surgery, but it's ACDF, okay? So you have a fusion at a couple levels that uh, heal into kyphosis. So if you want to correct this, anteriorly, you have to do osteotomy through the previous uh, uh, ACDF, which I did, okay? Only time, when you do this case, you have to be careful about whether facet is fused or not, uh, and you got a CAT scan. If facet is not fused, you can do anterior and posterior, just like the last case. If the facet is out of fuse, you got to go PAP. You got to release the facet posteriorly and then enter posterior. This patient facet was not fused, or at least I, I was able to crack it. So I did a uh, uh, osteotomy through the previous surgery, ACDF at the level, C2 to T2. Another interesting case. This is a post laminar kyphosis, but it's different. Patient has a profound myelopathy with a core signal and the uh, spinal cord drip, you know, anteriorly. So... I don't think I could do, maybe the panel can speak on this. If you just do multiple, uh, you know, uh, uh, ACDF, you may correct the uh, um, kyphosis, but you may stretch the spinal cord. I'm very nervous about the spinal cord. So I elected to do a multilevel colpectomy to transpose the just opposite of a laminoplasty and laminectomy. You want the spinal cord to drip anteriorly. 
So it's a long time ago I did, but uh, harm's cage. But that's exactly what I did. Mortilabor compact me. Once again, my principle we I publish is that don't put the plate in too early. You can just do a segmental fixation posteriorly, biomechanically strong, patient is fine. So my lapid case, just finish with a couple examples of osteotomy. Some patients, you cannot go in early. Previous surgery, some patients' deformity is so bad that you cannot correct their deformity through multi-level, you know, anterior and posterior. That's where you have to do osteotomy. There are two types of osteotomy, as you know, just like, you know, Smith-Peterson opening up or, you know, uh, quasi-PSO, you know, closed wedge. And in the old days, uh, Simmons era from Canada, he did the opening wedge, but that's kind of dangerous now. You're putting, you know, a sharp spike on the esophagus and so forth. I think that most people do PSO type of, uh, that's what I do. I've been doing this in my first case 20 years ago with uh, post-surgical severe kyphosis, actually myelopathy that I had to do a laminectomy because uh, I cannot go anteriorly. I mean, you can't even position this patient to go anteriorly. And you got C7, T1 dislocation, not to mention the... So you got to do a complete laminectomy and you got to get rid of the spike of the bone at the uh, C7, T1 level to do a correction. Always you do a correction after decompression. If you try to correct something before you decompress, you're gonna paralyze the patient. This is an interesting patient with a tumor of the thyroid that had a laryngectomy. So ENT said you cannot go anteriorly. I mean, it's contraindicated, it's all scarred down. So only thing you can do is nothing or uh, C7 PSO, which I did to uh, uh, correct the kyphosis. Final case, this is uh, ankylosing spondylitis, not surgical, had a fracture which healed, but into little more kyphosis. He's really uncomfortable with the chin and chest. So I did the uh, uh, C7 PSO. So I'm showing a lot of cases of C7 PSO, which is sort of go-to operation for severe deformity, uh, like this patient before and after. Oh, I, I lied. One last case. This is a, uh, another sort of uh, not ankylosing spondylitis, but you know, seronegative psoriatic arthritis that has a similar. Actually, I did this patient um, 20 years ago with uh, PSO of the lumbar spine, but 20 years later, when you practice one place long enough, they come back. Uh, uh, with the chin and chest right now. And you can see I did that uh, 20 years ago, uh, PSO for the lumbar, did fine for 20 years, but recently with the chin and chest. So I did the uh, um, C7 PSO. And you can see much better, you know, uh, chin bra angle improved and so forth. So I just wanna show you some of the interesting cases. So in conclusion, I mean, this is obviously, man. If you don't want to have too many revision surgery, obviously you want to, you know, uh, do a good job to decrease complication like non-union and post-laminectomy kyphosis. So infection is rare entirely, but infection is more common posteriorly, but really be careful about multilevel laminectomy, multilevel surgery posterior, meticulous closure of the muscle layer, very important uh, to prevent that, you know, uh, muscle pain and, and there's no cure for that. And we talked about, you know, prevention, non-union, and uh, the sort of uh, treatment strategies for spinal deformity. So that's all I have to say. Uh, uh, so I just want to, you know, uh, ask the panel if there's any, um, like, comments, questions, like, did I say anything bad? <laughs> Argument. <laughs> Maybe uh, Todd Albert has a comment. <laughs> Cervical spine. Howard, it's Jack yes. Sigler. Just a, a question. Uh, I'm glad the flights between Dallas and Chicago are not that expensive because <laughs> instead of sending them down the hall to Izzy, I think I'm going to send them to you. But when you do your PSO, do you take out one of the, the uh, sets of pedicles? Um, how do you avoid that? Yeah, yeah. PSO closing of roof? the cervical spine is a little different than lumbar spine, okay? So it's same as a lumbar spine that, yes, you do take out the pedicle of C7. Some people T1, but I do C7. So okay. when you take out the C7, you're talking about the C7 root and C8 root exiting in the, so it's very important to do a general trauma in army to make sure that you don't get a C8 deficit or C7 deficit. That's the first point I make. And then when you do the, uh, that, uh, 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 the actually PSO, the vertebral body removal, yeah, you can do it anywhere away, but it, it, it's because the vertebral body is very small. It's like when I do PSO lumbar, you know, you really want to expose the lateral aspect of the vertebral body, and carefully, you know, uh, use osteotum, whatever, you, to really take the wedge out. But in the cervical spine, it's so small that you don't need to do that. You basically do an axial operation. You really weaken, you know, that area of the bone, and and there are many ways to correct it. So what, what I do is uh, I do everything almost like a, leave a little thin shelf of, you know, post uh, on the lateral wall, and 
uh, my fellow scrubs out, and then you just change the angle of the, you know, uh, 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 Mayfield frame, but you have to have a one rod attached, so there's no translation, dangerous maneuver, but that's sort of my technique. Thank you, Howard. Yeah. So, Howard, it's Todd. It was a yeah. really great, great lecture. I just wanted to extend on something Jack asked you. You know, so many people have really moved. I used to do a C7 all the time for those osteotomies, but so, like so many people are moving distally to do the osteotomy. Only I heard a is a little easier and um, less chance of, of injuring C8, which is pretty disabling when, if you've had a C8 palsy from it. And I just wondered if you were. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've heard that. That's why I sort of mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, I haven't had, you know, I mean, I had temporary sort of radiculitis, no question. But so far, fortunately, I haven't had a, you know, a true deficit. So maybe the you know, next time, next time I get it, I'll change it. But T1, I think, is is a little harder in terms of correction because it does it's less, less mobile. So C7 is very after you do a you know decompression, it's really easy to get a good correction. So that, that every every you know approach has a little positive and negative. So maybe I'll try T1, but. And you're the right. Only, yeah, the only other question I was going to ask you is when you do post laminectomies, are you taking off the laminectomy membrane? You know, when you go in there and they have that thick laminectomy membrane so that when you correct them, they don't get the posterior compression. Are you, are you doing uh, no, no, I, I don't. But uh, you're, you're right. There are some cases that actually Dan Rue talks about this post laminectomy membrane. Everybody has scar tissue over the laminectomy, but. Sometimes that, that tissue, whatever you call a membrane, is actually, a, you know, a contributes to compressive pathology. If that's the case, then you should try to remove it. Dangerous, but you should do it. But a lot of times it's not. It's, it's actually the deformity, you know. So, so the, uh, the care is obviously don't, don't go too deep. To, it's a little hard. You want to go deep enough so you don't leave a huge. Because when you do a postal anatomy approach again, you have to, you know, expose all the lateral mass for instrumentation, but then you don't, you don't want to leave a huge scar right in the middle. Then you cannot really get a, a lateral mass. So it's a fine line between go deep enough, leave a thin layer uh, of, you know, scar tissue over the uh, dura, but you know, I don't try to try to take uh, peel everything off. I don't do that routinely. Hey Howard, oh, yes. Howard, may, may I ask a question on your anterior reconstructions? You mentioned that your go-to graft is a frozen cortical cancellus, but in the situations of deformity corrections, we've seen more, not necessarily custom, but more lordotic or hyperlordotic cages. And I'd like to get your opinion on that. And if you do use uh, non-biologic cages, what would be your biologic of choice within the cage? Oh, I see what you mean. So, so. Yeah, this is, I, I sometimes I use I don't just use you know I show you a case where I use a distractible cage you know so there are many ways to you know uh, uh, do the operation but I, I'm talking about for the healing potential that's what I meant is the cortical cancellous allograph is better than cortical uh, allograph or, or just a peak alone in my opinion. Uh, however, you know peak is changing with the porosity and even the uh, metals are changing with the better you know uh, modulus elasticity so things are improving but. Uh, you're right. I mean, in terms of deforming correction and truly, there are many options are being available with more lordotic, you know, more distractible kind. So I think that we have more options uh, uh, to use different uh, depending on the cases. So it's, I'm not just sold to, you know, uh, allograph, you know, in every case. It's a very good question. I think those are very interesting questions and uh, discussion, but I think we should move on to have and some of the you know hold your thoughts because throughout this presentation you're going to have a chance to i told each fellow to really make the presentation kind of short so we have more interactive you know uh question and uh, answer so uh christian uh, kana is uh, one of our fellows who so came from ucsf and he's going to boston next year so he, he he's going to present on i guess another case of cervical kyphosis so christian go ahead yeah great um, so this case is about cervical kyphosis. Let me make sure I can control my screen here. Okay, perfect. So uh, the patient is an 80-year-old female. She has a several-year history of axial neck pain. She has difficulty looking up. No radiculopathy, no focal weakness, no myelopathy symptoms. Pass outcomes, uh, okay. depending on how you think about it. Uh, oh, 
Is that is that better? Yeah, better now. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, her exam is uh, her neck is held in kyphosis. Uh, she's unable to maintain a forward gaze. She has tenderness to palpation along her posterior neck. Left side's a little worse than the right. She has a negative Hoffman's, no spurlings, and she's neurologically intact. This is her pre-op imaging. Uh, on the AP, you can see that there's a slight coronal tilt to the right side uh, of her head. Um, but the sagittal is really quite impressive. You can see the uh, cervical kyphosis there. And then uh, notably, uh, the rest of her uh, sagittal parameters in her lumbar spine are shown. And what you can see is a, a compensatory lumbar lordosis um, that she has so that she can maintain some sort of a forward gaze. Looking more in depth to some of her radiographic markers, uh, her cervical lordosis is actually a cervical kyphosis with, uh, of 36 degrees. Her chin brow angle is uh, 21 degrees compared to the vertical. Her uh, cervical SVA is 67 millimeters, and then her T1 slope is 24.1 degrees. Here's a CT scan um, demonstrating, again, that kyphosis, but most notably what we can see here is a lack of ankylosis, and that, that applied also to the posterior elements of her spine. And then here's an MRI. Interestingly, just I think because of the length of the MRI, there was some correction of her deformity uh, during this. And uh, the primary thing to see here is that she does not have any sort of cord compression um, throughout her cervical spine. So the diagnosis here was a semi-rigid cervical kyphosis, and the surgical plan was a anterior cervical discectomy infusion from C3 to T1, uh, followed by a C2 to T2 um, posterior instrument infusion. A few notable things uh, to mention uh, about uh, cervical kyphosis. The measurements do have some relevance here. Uh, the literature shows that a C2 to C7 SVA greater than 40 millimeters uh, is correlated to worse clinical outcomes. A T1 slope greater than 40 degrees as well. And then a T1 slope minus the cervical lordosis greater than 20 degrees, um, kind of a comparable uh, measurement to uh, the PILL mismatch, uh, is also uh, has worse clinical outcomes. The, uh, another thing to note is a T1 slope greater than 25 degrees suggests that there may be some sort of overall sagittal imbalance. And so if you're seeing a patient with that kind of T1 slope, uh, it's important to consider full-length standing films to determine the driver of the deformity. The surgical goals in this kind of surgery, uh, obviously deformity-specific, you want to restore the normal subaxial cervical lordosis. You want to achieve a SVA of the cervical spine less than 40 degree, uh, 40 millimeters. And then most importantly is restoring the horizontal gaze since that's the driver of, of this, um, uh, this sort of problem for the patient. And then surgery specific goals, uh, you obviously want to achieve a solid fusion and then decompress the neural elements uh, when necessary. Here's just some literature uh, looking at uh, some reviews uh, on cervical spine deformity. Um, it looked at a number of patients, both AP, po both anterior, posterior, and circumferential approaches. And better correction was found with dorsal approaches and uh, 360 approaches. Um, there was a common loss of postoperative correction, and that neurologic complications were actually quite common. Overall, uh, the findings were about 14%, and then especially after osteotomies, almost a quarter of the patients who had osteotomies had some sort of neurologic complication. It's also a reasonably high mortality rate afterwards. But overall, there was a high satisfaction after this sort of surgery and deformity correction and uh, general improvement in outcome scores. These are the post-op images of this patient uh, that you can see. Um, a C3 to T1 uh, anterior cervical discectomy infusion was performed at multiple levels. There was no anterior plate placed, um, and the patient was flipped, and a C2 to T2 posterior spinal fusion was performed um, with, uh, you can see the C2 instrumentation is a pedicle screw and a PARS screw, and then pedicle screws um, at the lower levels. Okay. Is that it? That's it. All right, very nice case. It's my case, as I'm commenting on it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so uh, I think this is a nice case that, um, that we can, you know, take five minutes to discuss because this is sort of is a more recent case of mine that, you know, um, fellow presented. So we, we can talk about, you know, anything that I talked about, any specific, you know, question or, you know, about this. Uh, I think I cut somebody off uh, before this. Uh, who hey, Howard. Yeah, Howard, yeah, can, ahead, yeah. can you comment on the neurologic problems that you've had with these major cases? Are you yeah, talking nerve root problems? You're talking yeah, cord injuries? No, no, no. There, there, there are not my personal, but there are cases. I mean, C7 
whether it's a C7 or T1 PSO is a dangerous operation. I just want to say that because you, you, you can have a paralysis in a second, okay? So, so I, I, this is a, a procedure should be done as a last resort, try to do other things. So that's one, I don't want to take it lightly, number one. So you can, you can get, for, fortunately so far, I haven't had, you know, a spinal cord injury. That's, that's just, I guess just being lucky. However, nerve root problem is more common. So as I said, unless you do a really good prominotomy, you're going to get C7 or CA radiculopathy. And I had a couple of patients had a temporary, you know, sort of radicalized, but they got better, I think. But I want to do a good prominotomy. But I just want it, it, to, it's, it's a during, once again, osteotomy, the final stage, unless you're very careful to sort of lock, semi loosely, rock, you know, you know, lock the uh, screws, you can translate. That's the main problem. Then you got a sheer force on the spinal cord. That's number one. Okay, so you want to do that gently. I think Dan Ru uses the, the not my method, but he uses his uh, traction maneuver to uh, uh, correct this. So there are many ways to do it, but it's a dangerous operation. I just want to say. Any other? Uh, uh, comments or question about this case? Dr. Ron, I have a question. Uh, it's Terrence Kim from Los Angeles. Yes. Um, can you talk to us about uh, LIV? Um, is, is, are you always going down to T2? Um, do you change that if you do a C7 PSO? If you don't do ACDs, do you take it lower? Where, how, uh, do you use a third rod? How do you um, uh, formulate your kind of LIV? Yeah, L L LIV is important. I think the minimum you should go down is the LIV is a T2, okay? So when I when I do C7 PSO, I mean, you should go down because you want to have a, enough fixation proximal and distally. That's number one. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, there are such things as, you know, uh, PJK. There are such things as DJK. You can have uh, actually uh, a distal junctional, you know, uh, problem with uh, either deformity or degeneration. So a lot of times... Uh, when I instrument uh, down to T T2, sometimes I do a fusion down to T3, for example, to, 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 just to give you. Not every case, but if I have uh, you know uh, any issues with the thoracic kyphosis or you know uh, uh, any issues, then it's a soft landing, if you will. But uh, but for the most part, uh, I, I think that if you have a really rigid and good fixation, uh, C T C2 to uh, uh, T2 has served me, served me well. So that's the uh, answer. But good question though, Terrence. Any other uh, question or comments about yeah, this? Yeah, Dr. Dr. An, uh, very quickly, you mentioned earlier in your talk, but it's definitely irrelevant. Simple question about closure technique. Yeah. In my own practice, I'll often see little old ladies who have done this beautiful instrumented fusion who come back to me two or three years later with a fascial dehiscence that I didn't even yes. notice a year or two out. Is that my technique or is it the fact that these people are so small with the hardware? What do you think is going on? No, it's your technique. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, this is more common than you think. Because uh, I, I learn hard ways. I mean, if, uh, you know, because, you know, you, you spend, I don't know, three, four hours doing delicate work. And last thing you want to do is, you know, closure, right? Uh, uh, so we either do a sloppy job closure or let the residents uh, clo close it. And that's a problem. So, and unfortunately, I see this all the time now, not my own patient, but, you know, referral case where the, and when you have this problem without any underlying problem, there's nothing you can do. I mean, uh, you cannot just go in there, try, uh, you know, if there's some underlying problem, then you use the opportunity to, you know, try to get a plastic involved and, and, and it's just a neck pain. It's not like a recurrent, you know, uh, uh, nerve problem, so, but it's neck pain is so disabling and there's nothing you can do. So only thing we have to do is to prevent. And if you talk to Dan Rue about it, and Dan Rue is the one who really uh, brought this issue, you know, uh, uh, and he, he goes overboard, in my opinion. I mean, he, I didn't know there were 20 layers, but he says, I close it, the 20 layer. I mean, he's exaggerating a little bit, but he spent so many you know, layers and time to close so that there's absolutely no way for the, you know, uh, uh, muscle layers and uh, fascia dehiscence. So just, I'm just saying all these things for the audience who are listening. Whenever you do posterior surgery, bilateral, you know, whether it's two level, three level, spend time. Do a meticulous, you know, fascial to close. That's that's the that's a very important question, and uh, we want to emphasize that. Any other question or comments? Yeah, it, Pat Johnson again. Yeah, Pat. Yeah. Hey, very nice case. I'm sorry I came in a little bit late, mm -hmm. and 
You know, the comment about fascial dehiscence is one that's a problem, and we, we've dealt with a number of them. Uh, unfortunately, some of them we've created ourselves. And I think that prevention is indeed the best way to deal with those things. And you can't walk out because it's interesting is that ha after having done lots and lots of posterior cervical surgery for many, many years, is that you're right, the closure is the most important thing and actually identifying the fascial layers because the fascia will actually retract around to where if you don't have somebody there that knows that and can actually pull the fascia back together, make sure you have absolutely the right layer. In fact, I don't think you have to close multiple, multiple layers. In fact, all you have to do is close the one absolute layer and get the fascia back together, put figure of eight stitches in or whatever it is that you do, but the fascia has to come back together. Mm -hmm. If you have those problems, um, we actually did one just recently and uh, we see them come along often enough. I've kind of gotten our plastic surgeons trained is that I used to have one at UCLA who was really good and at Cedars, I've had to train another one here and they actually will go in and dissect all of those layers out. They are so good at it, they understand every fascial layer. And if they understand that the fascia has sucked around laterally, you can fix them and you can do it and they can do it. And I just did one the other day and they do a beautiful job. You kind of have to train them because I've had a couple plastic okay. versions. I've fired them because if they go in there, they just <laughs> sew everything they, or they just think they can pull it together. It actually has to be dissected apart, just like back when you did the operation and all of those layers are there. So if they don't dissect out, the fascia from the muscle and they have every one of them and they close it over with like a, a pants and suspender or a belt and suspenders kind of approach to it is that they won't work either. So you can fix those things and they're really debilitating for patients because what happens is the muscles will pull and it'll actually pull the patient into kyphosis. Right, it's kyphogenic. It'll change their trajectory. So, so Patrick, that's a very important, important. Nice comment. So that's, that's, uh, but so if I have a patient, you know, uh, with that, with nothing else, I so far I've been telling that there's nothing I can do, you know, sorry. But now you're telling me that you can really train the plastic surgeons to actually fix that. So that's a good in, new information I learned. So thank you very much, Patrick. So, okay, we'll, we're going to continue a uh, lot of, you know, good questions and discussion. So uh, keep your, you know, uh, questions in mind. And then we're going to talk about the second um, uh, your case on cervical spine metastasis, and we have a Sapan Gandhi, who is another fellow who uh, came from Beaumont. He's going to uh, Beth Israel, Boston. We're going to have uh, two fellows going to Boston. Sorry, the Boston guys. <laughs> so he's going to present uh, this case. Uh, and, and Dr. Uh, Matt Coleman is going to moderate right after he uh, uh, presents this. All right. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Yeah, um, like you mentioned, uh, my name is Sapan Gandhi. I'm one of the spine surgery fellows here. And I'm going to present a case on a cervical tumor. <laughs> so um, this is a 72-year-old female comes in with a chief complaint of le uh, neck pain and left upper extremity pain. Um, started about six months ago, and she can recall an incident after workout class where she sort of started having neck pain. And since that time, the pain's gotten worse. Um, she also has left upper extremity burning. Um, as well as weakness in the left hand uh, and arm. Uh, she feels like her, her fine motor skills are getting a little bit worse and um, has less dexterity, especially on the left side um, compared to before. Uh, prior to coming to the uh, clinic, she had an MRI done that showed uh, multiple spine lesions. Of note, she has a history of breast cancer that had been treated with um, uh, surgery and, and chemotherapy, um, but She's actually been off all treatment for the past four years and, and in remission. She follows with the oncologist and hasn't had any sort of treatment for the last four years. Um, on exam, um, she has three out of five left triceps and wrist extensor strength, two out of five left inner OCI strength, and a positive Hoffman's on the left. Uh, she's got intact motor strength on the right. So the clinical impression is myeloradiculopathy with an obvious uh, suspected uh, neoplastic etiology. Um, here are her plain film x-rays. So you can see on the lateral, um, she has a, quite a bit of cervical kyphosis, um, which appears to be focally at, at C6 and C7. Um, on the AP, you can, you know, it gives you an idea of how much kyph kyphosis she has. You can't even see the subaxial 
cervical spine unless she she uh, opens her mouth. Um, here is the uh, uh, CT scans that she got. Um, and again, you see a large uh, destructive lesion um, at uh, C67 uh, and focal kyphosis uh, through that level. Um, the CT scan also uh, shows you that she's got lytic lesion and the vertebral bodies of C3 and C4. Um, and in the, in the posterior elements on the left, she's got a, a lytic lesion at the lateral mass of, uh, of C4. And on the right, uh, the lateral mass of C3, C5, uh, C6, and, and maybe C7 there. Um, you can even, uh, at C71 um, uh, on the right, that facet joint appears to be um, either slightly sublux or maybe perched, um, indicating some, some level of in instability there. Here's their MRI scan, and T1 on the left, T2 on the right. And on the, uh, you can see the extent uh, of tumor from C3 down to C7. Um, here's some axial cuts. So at C5, 6, you can see that not only does she have the, the kyphotic deformity that's causing some pressure on the cord anteriorly there, but she's also got uh, what appears to be uh, the tumor into the spinal canal uh, that you can see on, that, on the axial view there. Here's uh, um, behind the body of C6. And again, you can see it's a tumor in the canal anteriorly uh, compressing the cord and, and the left, the left uh, uh, exiting nerve root. And then this view shows that by the time you get down to C7, T1, um, uh, there doesn't appear to be any more compression. So all of the tumor and compressive pathology is proximal to that point. So the diagnosis is a cervical myeloradiculopathy um, secondary to kyphotic, kyphotic deformity and cervical stenosis uh, from metastatic disease. And she, um, this is presumed to be breast cancer, which was biopsy proven from another site. So when we're planning this, obviously we have anterior approaches, posterior approaches, and combined approaches on the table. Um, in this systematic review of the literature, um, in the subaxial C-spine, uh, when planning uh, surgery for, for metastasis, uh, anterior fusion seemed to be the, um, the uh, preferred approach, as is for, for many of our cervical spine pathologies. Um, interestingly, uh, what they found was that a combined approach was favored when there's multi-level disease, uh, circumferential tumor involvement, or bone, bone quality, which is a little bit intuitive, um, but is borne out in the literature. And in our case, um, we have uh, two, two of the three uh, that they found to be important uh, when deciding on a combined approach. So we decided to do an anterior cervical uh, corpectomy infusion at C6 and C7, uh, followed by a long multi-level posterior spinal fusion from C2 to T2. Picked the, this long contract partially because uh, we were going to do a multi-level corpectomy and need a rigid contract, partially because um, you know the intent was to, uh, for her to undergo treatment for breast cancer afterwards, and uh, she would likely be slow to uh, get a solid fusion at that level because of that treatment, and um, and and partially because of the extent of tumor that you know we saw in the CT scan making it difficult to get good fixation at, at several levels because of, of the lytic lesions. So here's some intraoperative films. We, we did the front side first, um, did two-level corpectomy, and then uh, flip, flipped her uh, and did the posterior instrumentation. At uh, C2, we elected to use a, a pedicle screw as well as a, a, a laminar screw because of the patient's um, anatomy, and we extended... Um, a down to T2 with, pe with pedicle screws at uh, T1 and T2. These are post-op films um, about one week out, uh, and you can see we, we were able to restore some of her uh, lordosis and, and uh, fix some of that kyphotic deformity. Um, she had a uh, fairly dramatic resolution of her left upper extremity pain, um, but the weakness, um, as, as a lot of you guys might say, uh, was a little bit slower to come back. She had uh, actually had a lot of improvement in her neck pain as well. Um, because of the you know COVID pandemic, we don't have more recent films, but we've been talking to her via telemedicine and, and she's doing well clinically. Matt, can you uh, take over a discussion or is Matt here? 
Okay, man. Okay, man may not be here, so I'll pinch his. Oh, oh man, go ahead. Do you mute it, man? <laughs> okay, so I, I don't think we're gonna hear Matt Coleman's, uh, right? Howard, if I can just uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. It's, it's a easy. couple questions. First of all, uh, one of the things was, and I may have missed it when you're presenting it, but was it biopsy proven before you took her to the operating room? It was. Um, you know, this is an interesting case because she. This was the first evidence. She had widespread metastasis, so she had it biopsy proven at another bony site prior to her going to the operating room. Yeah. And one of the things I think it needs to really be addressed when you're dealing with these metastatic cases is the pathology. And, and I can't emphasize that enough. That is probably the single most important decision maker uh, that I've experienced in terms of reconstructing and rebuilding. If this is myeloma or lymphoma, you're going to be doing something completely different here. If this is renal cell, you're doing something far different than this. Uh, lung cancer, breast cancer, yeah, this is probably the way to go. So I, I think you really have to pay attention to what the pathology is before you embark on any one of these reconstructions in these individuals. Yep. Matt, uh, can you... Uh, sure. Uh, I, I think it's a very nice case. And, and, you know, I kind of commend you for how you did this because I looked at it and said, gee, I see tumor all the way up and down. And, uh, you know, this patient has a bad disease, and uh, I, I didn't really hear too much about what's considered for longevity. All oncologists are, are optimists by definition. Um, something's changed. I don't know what her receptors are like, but it, in any event, in any event, the goal is to prevent the patient from going paralyzed because it, it looks like a a uh, pathologic fractured level and doing a corpectomy at that level and leaving the other ones alone, yeah, I think is a good way to treat that because the patient's going to be treated with radiotherapy, chemotherapy. If she ever has tumor growth uh, in the upper cervical segments that were not treated from the front side, I think that's just called good judgment. Is that, you know, you, you have to pick your battles and and just treat this as best you can and uh, you're, you're hitting a few bases also by doing the posterior instrumentation which I think is a good thing to do just because if and when she needs another operation from the front side and those upper cervical segments if it needs to be done you've already covered that base so I, I think that was a really good tactic and strategy commend you for that one Thank okay, you. Pat. Can you guys hear me better now? Can, can you yeah, hear me? Yeah, 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 Matt. Any okay, comments? Perfect. I'm sorry about that. I, I don't know why the audio dropped off. Um, yeah, I, the, the first moderating question I was going to ask Seppin is, is how in the world do we make sense? I mean, you, we can have a technical discussion, and I appreciate the comments, but I think one of the hardest things about these tumor cases is deciding who to do this to. I mean, this is a, this is a home run operation, a very big operation. We did it all in one day in two stages, but nevertheless... Um, if you do this on everybody, you're gonna you're gonna lose a lot. So, Stefan, how do we how do we what fact? And this case is kind of unique. I talked to you a little bit about some of the. I mean, to put you on the spot, but what, like, how do we how do we decide to go for broke on these very very diffuse cases? Yeah, I, I think uh, Dr. Lieberman uh, uh, alluded to this a little bit, knowing what the pathology is, whether it's treatable or not, and what the longevity of the patient's important. I think knowing what the patient's symptom symptomatology is as well is important. Um, I think if this patient um, was going through multiple rounds of, of uh, systemic treatment, and uh, and was failing those treatments, and then you found widespread metastasis. I think is a, is less uh, likely of a patient to do well from a big surgical operation versus someone who still has systemic treatment in front of them, is treatment naive, so to speak, and and uh, still has a lot of cards to extend their life for a longer period of time. Um, is probably better suited for a sur surgery like this. Yeah, so you're talking about latency, and that's that's super important. I think availability of of new, you know, novel and targeted systemic treatments that you you can find out about by talking to the medical oncologist, and you know, really underscoring the 
the multidisciplinary aspect of these cases. You really can't do them in a vacuum. Um, and then the last comment I'll make is just that uh, there are there are data out there to help you with these decisions. You don't just have to guess at it at, or ask the medical oncologist and leave it up to them. Um, you know, the modified Bauer, Tokahashi, those are the, the classic scoring systems to understand prognosis, but they're pretty limited. You know, we're, we're a little bit more sophisticated than that in 2020, I believe. There's there's scoring systems. Not one has emerged as the gold standard, but scoring systems which incorporate, you know, laboratory results like albumin and, and uh, performance status, those kind of things are really important. So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate your comments. I think so, you're right. So, Matt, Matt uh, just, can you just tell us about, you know, the sort of, Radiation Very good, treatment, you know, like chemo, chemotherapy treatment, the timing. Do you know what I'm saying? What's the idea? Of how, how you know? Can you do you have to wait like three weeks, or can you just tell us? You know, just go thirty seconds. You know, can you tell us? Yeah, that's an awesome, awesome point, Doctor. I think I think the biggest thing for a patient with diffuse disease like this is really the systemic therapy. That's the only thing that's going to go everywhere and get this disease under control. Because obviously, if it doesn't come under control, no matter what you do, it's it's going to be a bad outcome. So. Um, most times, you know, with modern targeted therapy, there's actually no hold to those drugs. So we can even give them through surgery, depending on what it is. But that's the really critical discussion for me with the medical oncologist is what novel drug are you using? What's the perioperative recommendation for it? Because a lot of times we don't even have to stop it. But for radiation, I think it's an important question. Um, I, I... I've gone back and forth. I, I think technically you can start, in my practice, I technically start radiation for aggressive disease or when I, do, when I can't do a total resection. I try to start it as soon as I can, meaning once the wound is healed, so 10 days, two weeks. And I, I start it and I leave the nylon sutures in for another two weeks. I just let them sit there. Um, but if you're really going for long-term survival and, and a, an arthrodesis, I try to wait until about six weeks. So it's, it's host dependent, but I think you can, you can delay the radiation for six weeks and that's usually okay. Okay. That, good, good answer. Cause you know, talk about bone healing issues and all that. I think we can talk about this case forever. So, but you know, we got only 10 minutes left. So we're going to present the final uh, deformity case by Dr. Evan Shira. He came from HSS going back to HSS. So Evan, you're next. Thanks, Dr. Ron. Yeah, Dr. Ron showed like 20 cervical cases over the span of two minutes, so he wanted me to switch it up a little bit and uh, and change gears a little bit. We'll have a, a thoracolumbar deformity case. There we go, able to control the screen now. All right, so we have a patient, a 61-year-old lady. She's got chronic back pain that's been worsening. Uh, it's exacerbated by, long, by prolonged sitting or standing. Uh, but a primary component of her pain is over her coccyx, uh, especially when she, she sits for any period of time. Uh, she also uh, complains of a, a left L5 distribution radiculopathy, a little bit of right thigh pain, but it's mainly a back pain uh, deformity patient. Uh, she's done PT with some relief, occasional uh, Tylenol 3 uh, when her pain's out of control, and she's been on gabapentin for a while. On her exam, she's clinically globally kyphotic, uh, in her uh, sagittal balance, just looking at her. So she's got significant mid-back pain when she's light supine, uh, but notably she has no hip contractures, uh, and she's got severe tenderness palpation over her coccyx. Otherwise, uh, she's neurovascularly intact. So here are some of her images. Uh, coronal scoli films on the left, standing films. Not much in the way of a coronal deformity, but there's a small fractional curve at the bottom, uh, which might be contributing to some of that uh, left uh, L5 radiculopathy. Uh, and then the middle image there, I think, highlights the degree of the uh, the global kyphosis that she's dealing with, especially in the thoracolumbar region. That'll be uh, better elucidated in the next slide with some of the measurements. And I included this slide, this image here on the right, uh, demonstrating uh, sort of the the vertical nature of her of her uh, sacrum, uh, secondary to that uh, compensatory pelvic retroversion. So some of those measurements I talked about, notably she's got a lumbar low dose of 19 degrees. Um, most notably her uh, thoracolumbar kyphosis measures 25 degrees and she has a pelvic tilt of 34 and a sacral slope of 11. So she's really trying to retrovert her pelvis to stand upright. Uh, overall sagittal balance with those compensatory maneuvers is not terrible at six centimeters uh, SVA and her PIL mismatch uh, is 24. 
Uh, so just some uh, MRI images highlighting uh, sort of, you know, elucidating her uh, L5 complaint. She has a little bit of uh, lateral recess stenosis uh, at L4 or 5 on the left, but also some foraminal stenosis here seen on the T1 parasagittal is worse on the left than on the right. Uh, probably secondary to that uh, fractional curve. Uh, Alexis, having trouble advancing this slide, if you're able to help me out. There we go. Thank you. Uh, so for this lady, she's got adult spinal uh, deformity, primarily presenting as a global kyphosis. Whoops. Um, a main component of that is that thoracolumbar kyphosis. Um, and she's got some uh, compensatory pelvic retroversion with a verticalized sacrum that's causing her pain. Uh, and then left L4-5 lateral recess stenosis and 5-1 foraminal stenosis. So I think I gave up the plan here. I think I'll jump to it, uh, given that we're running out of time here. This is a two-stage procedure. We did an L4 to S1 A lift with hyperlurid cages, uh, followed by L2 to L4 X lift in the first stage. And then stage was a posterior, stage two was a posterior spinal fusion, T4 to the pelvis uh, with uh, T11 to L3 uh, Smith Peets. So here's the uh, images from the first stage. I don't have these measured because they were fluoro images. Um, but the final construct here demonstrates uh, this excellent restoration over lumbar lordosis, especially the um, thoracic kyph or the thoracolumbar kyphosis that she had went from 25 to 4 degrees. Um, and her pelvic tilt uh, and sacral slope essentially um, changed positions there. She's now uh, not, no longer retroverting her pelvis to stand upright. Still well balanced with an SVA of uh, 3.8 and her PIL mismatch is 10 degrees. Uh, so just wanted to show this case. I, mean, this, I think this approach to deformity surgery is uh, gaining a little bit more um, attention in the literature. A couple recent studies, one from 2020 and the other I think from 2018, uh, we're looking at multi-level um, anterior column inner bodies versus PSO. Um, and in both of these studies, they found no real difference in their ability to uh, achieve correction, the goals of surgery, uh, no difference in PJK rates or pelvic parameters at the end. But they did find that in the uh, multi-level anterior inner body cases, there was less blood loss. Um, and then a trend towards uh, fewer revisions and decreased rates of pseudarthrosis or rod fracture uh, when using multi-level anterior inner bodies. So turn it over to the panelists if anyone has any input, uh, but just a, a different approach than a, a PSO would be to uh, achieve the similar goals. All right, so I have a maybe a comment from uh, Izzy uh, Lieberman. I mean, this is how we treat coccidinia at Rush. Just want to let you know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good. Now I know. Now I know where to send all of my <laughs> patients. Uh, so you're, you're not going to argue with radiographic success here. Uh, the real issue is going to be her functional outcome on this, and I, I suspect her functional outcome will be very good on the basis of her profile. Uh, but you still have to look at that. The, the one thing that I am most concerned about, and I do see this now over and over and over again, is the very liberal use of lateral interbodies at multiple levels. And I'm not sure we need to be doing it as much as we are. And I think the pendulum has started to swing and everyone's on the pendulum and pushing it across. Uh, for this lady, I, I must admit, I would have done the 4551 A lifts on her, but I would have relied on just my Smith Peets at all the other levels and opened up each of those disc spaces, hinged on the posterior cortex at the 342312 level, and made sure that I've got her sagittal vertical axis behind her hip joints. So I know that the line is falling down, the gravity line's falling down, and I don't have to worry about the increased potential morbidity of laterals, and also the increased economic cost of the laterals in these cases. Now, this worked out well, but I am seeing a trend with a lot of people who feel that they're deformity surgeons and doing all these laterals all the way up and down, and then they're showing up on my doorstep with multi-level pseudarthroses and screws all over the place uh, that I, I just can't salvage. You just can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again when that's happened. So that's the caution that I'd, I'd 
put out there to the audience? It's a very good comment. So I tend to agree with that, actually. So uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, we, we have four minutes to go. So anybody can comment about this case or anything we talked about or anything for that matter for the next three minutes. Is Dr. Duol online? Because I know he, he uh, this is his case. No, and, uh, okay, so he has some other emergencies that... Uh, um, so I, I think that, you know, for this, just one comment about this deformity case is that if you just don't pay attention to public parameters and just look at the, you know, the cop angle of the primary deformity, it doesn't look that bad. But, you know, uh, when you put everything together, so it's a, I think the patient assessment becomes critical. Uh, it's not just where the x-ray looks bad, it's the, the you know, try, patient trying to retrovert the pelvis, causing the pain in the distal aspect, even down to the coccyx. It is all about the patient assessment that we have, you know, uh, learned over the last, you know, 15 years about the pelvic par parameters. So I think uh, this is a good example of that. Um, uh, so any other, I mean, uh, any other questions about anything we talked about, any cases or any questions? Yes. Howard, um, I think this was great, but next time, could you show us some more challenging cases? Really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, unbelievable cases. Now, you need, you need a disclosure to the fellows. you got to tell them that this is not their first or their hundredth case that they do when they get out of fellowship. That's true. <laughs> good, good comments. <laughs> Rick Sasso has been very quiet because he's a genius in cervical spine, so I, I want him to say something before we close. <laughs> that was all good. That was all good, Howard. All very, right, very thanks. good. Thanks, Rick. All right, so that's it from Rush, and uh, I look, look forward to, you know, another meeting like this. So thank you, everybody, for attending, and appreciate the audience, too. Bye-bye. All right, <laughs> thanks, Howard. Uh, thanks, thanks, Howard. Howard. Right. Thank, thank you, you, SSF. Such a great, uh, great case. Thank you, everyone. Great okay, bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.